I'm delighted to have an opportunity to tell you about our approach to enable personalized diagnosis and therapy of sensory neural hearing loss. And I'll give you examples of the insights we have gained from human tissues. The sense of hearing is so important for our uh, communication. And let me see, why is this not advancing? That is very interesting. Again, we tested everything before, <laughs> so, but now it's stuck. Hmm. Yeah, Maybe Teresa it. can advance it <laughs> if she knows. Well, uh, Tanuja, any insights into why this is now not working? It's not advancing. I'm on a tour of some audio visuals. Yeah. I'm going to sign up for that one. We'll let you take it. Yeah, that's it. It's here. Normally, it's where it advances and nothing is happening. There you go, boss. All right, how are you, Greg? It's good to see you. Yeah. <laughs> it woke up. The computer woke up. So thank you, everyone, for your patience. And I just want to highlight how important the sense of hearing is for our communication and for uh, comprehending the world around us. Uh, this is a picture of the center of our galaxy. And sound is used even to sonify data. So when you convert... Uh, pixels in this image to sound, then you can hear really beautiful music. Uh, so what happens then when the sense of hearing is injured? It of course leads to hearing loss, and hearing loss is the most common sensory deficit across the globe. It currently disables more than 400 million people, and this leads to the astronomical cost of Ex the excess of $750 billion annually uh, in terms of the unaddressed hearing loss. And uh, things are not really looking very bright because the World Health Organization estimates that over a billion young people are at risk of hearing loss, primarily due to recreational noise exposures. And when you look at hearing loss across the lifespan, it affects 16% of the workforce the number doubles by the retirement age, and then affects nearly three quarters of the octogenarians. So now, given the magnitude of the problem, it's really mind boggling that today, in the 21st century, there are no drugs that are FDA approved for hearing loss. And it's certainly not for the lack of trying, because lots of time and money has been spent in hearing research, and many drugs have been identified to work really well in animal models, but nearly none of them have translated to human applications. And this is by no means unique to hearing. In fact, when you look at the traditional drug development, it's a highly unsuccessful approach because 90% of drugs fail in clinical trials, and they were selected for clinical trials because of their incredible success in animal models. This is also a very lengthy process, uh, taking about 10 years on average, and super expensive, in excess of two and a half billion dollars per drug. So I will now show you how we are trying to tackle this huge bottleneck, and I'll show you examples of two parallel approaches that are based on using human cells and tissues, and they're broadly applicable to all types of sensory neural hearing loss and sensory disorders in general, uh, but I'll illustrate their utility on two different types of hearing loss. So starting with the first approach, the idea is to develop human cellular models of hearing loss. Where we start with a patient, we collect their blood or skin sample. We convert these cells into induced pluripotent stem cells, which we can differentiate then into specific cell types, either in two dimensions, or we can let them self-organize into three-dimensional structures called organoids that mimic the organ of interest. And then we can use these cellular models for a variety of downstream applications from understanding the underlying disease mechanisms to functional assays, cell therapies, and drug testing. Importantly, drug testing could here be done on a high throughput scale because we are starting with stem cells. And we are not really cell limited because we can make huge numbers of cells and downstream um, organoids. So 
we have applied this methodology to gain insight into a very current issue, COVID-19, and in particular, COVID-19 associated audiovestibular symptoms. This is a series of 10 patients uh, collected from uh, five different institutions. Half of them are from Ashley Wackim at Rutgers University. And in the top row, you see patients' audiograms during COVID-19. And all of these patients had proven infection based on serologic testing and detection of SARS-CoV-2 virus. And you can see that after they recovered from COVID, uh, most of them ended up with permanent sensory neural hearing loss. Also, 90% of these patients had tinnitus, and 60% of them experienced vertigo. One of these patients, when imaged using high-resolution MRI with gadolinium, demonstrated enhancement of the inner ear, and in particular here you see enhancement of the vestibule, as well as strong enhancement of the facial nerve and enhancement of the audiovestibular nerve, which begs the question of, is it possible for the virus to directly infect inner ear tissue? And we decided to look at this question uh, by first saying, is human inner ear tissue capable of letting the virus come in? And to understand what is the molecular machinery required for that, I'll just quickly review what's known about how the virus infects cells. Basically, you know it's a coronavirus, it has these spikes, that's why it's called coronavirus, and the spike protein binds to ACE2, angiotensin converting enzyme receptor on uh, host cells. And then there are enzymes that cleave the spike. These enzymes are called furin and tempras 2 and cleavage of the spike allows the uh, viral membrane to fuse with the host cell membrane and allow delivery of the viral RNA into the cell and then its translation into new viral particles that get released and cause more infection. So the first step that we did is ask, do these cells derived from human-induced pluripotent stem cells, these inner ear cells, do they have these proteins? Do they have ACE2, furin, and tempras 2 and the answer is yes. This is the work of two postdoctoral fellows, uh, Min Jin Zhang and uh, Dong Jun Han, uh, who are uh, here with us now at Stanford. And in the first row, you see uh, cells, human-induced pluripotent stem cells. And then in the second row, it's otic prosensory cells. In the third row, it's Schwann cell progenitors. And then you see that all of them express these proteins. And at much higher levels, in more differentiated cells than in uh, stem cells. Now that they are, we know that they are capable of being infected, the question is, can we infect them? So that was the next step of actually exposing the tissue to the virus. And this was in collaboration with uh, Karen Okwija and um, Lee Gerke at MIT. And we see that indeed, if we now expose these cells to the virus, the virus can get in. And we have stain for viral uh, proteins, uh, including the nuclear capsid, as well as the double-stranded RNA. Now, that was two-dimensional cell models. The next step was to see, does this work in human inner ear organoids? So here is where we made organoids, and you can see uh, hair cells beautifully lining the lumen of the organoid. And then you can see in green, uh, neurites, and these hair cells abundantly expressed ACE2, which I told you is the receptor that allows the virus to get in. And now knowing that, when we expose uh, human inner ear organoids to the virus, we again see that it can get in, and the viral, uh, uh, viral particles are shown by immunostaining for the double-stranded RNA, shown here in purple, and you see that in the infected organoids, but not in the mock control organoids. And the cell type that is most susceptible to this infection is hair cell. This is highly relevant because in the patients who we followed who had hearing loss during COVID-19 infection, they had a drop in autoacoustic emissions as well. And we all know that autoacoustic emissions reflect outer hair cell function. Well, these are stem cell derived models. How relevant is that for adult human inner ear tissue? So to answer that question, we collected human inner ear tissue that we 
get access to from indicated surgeries, namely from labyrinthectomies that we perform either for intractable Meniere's disease, where we have to drill through the inner ear to uh, get rid of these life-threatening drop attacks, or when we drill through the inner ear to remove vestibular schwannoma by a translabyrinthine vestibular schwannoma resection. And the first step was to see what kind of tissue are we getting and does the tissue include hair cells? And the answer is yes, because when we stain for myo7a, which is a marker of hair cells, or TUBB3, which is a marker of neurons, uh, we see this beautiful arrangement of hair cells. And now uh, it turns out that these hair cells abundantly express proteins required for viral infection, and they primarily express them on their apical surfaces Schwann cells also express these proteins, but to a lesser degree, and neurites, and these are vestibular neurites, don't really express these proteins. So it's not that every cell type is susceptible to viral infection, because again, the cells have to have the machinery to allow the virus to get in. So now that we know that, we then infected this adult human uh, inner ear tissue, which we cultured for several days, and exposed to the virus. And again, we see that the virus very avidly infects primarily hair cells, uh, because these are zoomed in images of hair cells. And in purple, you see double-stranded RNA. And you can see that this hair cell really took a lot of the virus in. And we also see some infection of Schwann cells to a much lesser degree, and uh, not really neurites. So that then. Uh, completes my example of the first approach, which is based on using human cellular models of human hearing loss to gain insight into what is going on, and hopefully to open avenues for testing promising drugs going forward. Now I'll show you an example of a second approach, which is based on drug repositioning. So in contrast to traditional drug development that I uh, started to describe at the beginning, Drug repositioning or repurposing has very low failure rate because you are starting with drugs that already FDA approved for something else. It's relatively short because you can complete these studies in about five years, and it's much less expensive, although still very expensive. And I'll show you our example of this drug repositioning approach uh, applied to a particular disease called vestibular schwannoma which can occur either unilaterally and sporadically, as shown on the right, uh, in these uh, contrast-enhanced MRI images where you see the tumor right here. It's avidly taking up gadolinium. Or it can occur bilaterally as a part of the syndrome called neurofibromatosis type 2, where you see these bilateral vestibular schwannomas. This is an important cause of hearing loss. And again, there are no drugs that are currently available to uh, prevent this hearing loss or really to reliably uh, prevent tumor growth. Uh, and the real conundrum is what is the cause of hearing loss due to these tumors? Because these tumors arise typically from the vestibular nerve and most commonly they cause hearing loss. And what's written in most textbooks is that they do so by compressing the nearby auditory nerve. But examples like this tell us that it's not the only mechanism. Because if you now contrast these two different patients, both women of 50 at the, time, at the same age at the time of diagnosis, and now you see this small intracanalicular vestibular schwannoma that caused significant hearing loss and really poor word recognition of only 8%. And then on the right side, you see a bigger tumor with a very similar intracanalicular extent that cause only mild hearing loss and no drop in word recognition. So then what else is going on? Well, we think that uh, there are secreted molecules secreted by the tumor that can directly get to the cochlea and cause damage. But how do we prove that? And how do we figure out which molecules to focus on? Because there are so many to choose from. And to answer that question, we did a bioinformatic analysis where we performed the largest meta-analysis of vestibular schwannoma transcriptome to identify genes that are commonly and concordantly dysregulated in vestibular schwannoma. 
And once we had a list of hundreds of this, these different genes, we wanted to simplify this. So we analyzed it using pathway analysis. And it was striking that all of the top ranking pathways had to do with inflammation. This validated our previous study uh, published a few years prior where we used a different approach based on very uh, focused literature review and identifying molecules uh, dysregulated in vestibular schwannoma based on studies that had appropriate controls and had uh, appropriate uh, number of samples to reach uh, statistical power to say something definitively. So we still don't know which molecule to focus on. However, we have insights from other diseases that cause hearing loss, and we decided to zoom in on TNF-alpha or tumor necrosis factor alpha. This is a pro-inflammatory molecule that had previously been shown to be elevated in serum of patients with two, actually three other types of human hearing loss in sudden sensory neural hearing loss, in autoimmune inner ear disease, and it turns out that patients who have mutations in this gene are more susceptible to noise trauma. So when we look at concentration of TNF-alpha in tumor condition media, where we take tumors that we remove from surgeries, we incubate them in culture media, and then we measure concentrations of molecules that they secrete, we find that the concentration of TNF-alpha correlates with the severity of hearing loss when measured both in terms of word recognition and pure tone average. Well, this is correlative, but what's the mechanism? And to answer that, we did a study in guinea pigs now where we intracochlearly perfused TNF-alpha and measured hearing in response. These are technically very challenging experiments because your technique has to be impeccable. And first, you have to show that when you're perfusing more normal saline, you're not causing any hearing loss. And so when we did that, we found that intracochlear perfusion of TNF-alpha indeed causes hearing loss. It's neuropathic hearing loss characterized by a drop in the compound action potential amplitude shown here. But very importantly, we can prevent this loss if we treat uh, guinea pigs with a TNF-alpha blocker at Tanerset. So this is relevant when we're talking about possible drug repositioning because there are lots of TNF-alpha blockers on the market. They're used primarily in rheumatologic uh, domain to treat uh, all sorts of diseases, including rheumatoid arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. But TNF-alpha is most certainly not the only player. However, inflammation is a very important part of tumor pathobiology. So we decided to further dig into possible inflammatory pathways, and uh, we focused on the inflammasome. Inflammasome refers to a multicellular, oh, sorry, sorry, a multiprotein intracellular complex that mediates inflammation. And we looked at this because one particular molecule called NLRP3 had previously been shown to cause syndromic and non-syndromic hearing loss in humans when mutated. And when we look at these vestibular schwannomas and measure activation of uh, NLRP3 inflammasome and downstream genes, we find that it's much more activated in vestibular schwannomas than control great auricular nerves and to a much higher degree in tumors associated with poor hearing than good hearing. And we see that both at the gene level and at the protein level. And if you look here at the comparison on a, of one of these pro-inflammatory molecules uh, called interleukin-1-beta, that is relevant because it turns out that there is another drug already approved for other indications that is a specific IL-1-beta blocker. It's called uh, anakinra. And in patients who have uh, hearing loss due to NLRP3 inflammasome mutations, their hearing can be stabilized or improved when they are placed on anakinra, but they do not respond to steroids. So examples like this really highlight the need for understanding the nitty-gritty of molecular signaling to really understand what is most relevant for a given individual. All of these studies, uh, preclinical studies, uh, highlighting the importance of inflammation in vestibular schwannoma uh, growth and associated hearing loss led us to design a prospective randomized double-blind placebo-controlled 
uh, clinical trial of aspirin for vestibular schwannoma. We started with aspirin because it's a quintessential anti-inflammatory. It's already used in chemo prevention of multiple malignancies, including colorectal cancer, and it's safe. Millions of people have been on it for many years, even decades. This is a multi-center trial that from the very beginning included Stanford, and we look forward to really uh, completing this study, hopefully in the next couple of years. But inflammation is not the only player. What are some of the other important pathways? To get at that, we now did another type of bioinformatic analysis where we overlapped this meta-analysis of vestibular schwannoma transcriptome that I showed you previously with the human degradome database. And the degradome database includes all known proteases. When we overlap these two data sets, then we have identified many proteases that are up or down regulated. The majority of them are matrix meloproteases, or MMPs. Why that is relevant is because MMPs are known to play a very important role in cancer progression because they degrade the extracellular matrix, they allow these cells to migrate and proliferate. And we looked at all of matrix meloproteases that uh, bioinformatically we found to be dysregulated in vestibular schwannoma and found one of them to really stand out, namely matrix metalloprotease 14, uh, where we looked at tumor tissue, and this is all human tissue, compared to control grade auricular nerves and find that in tumors, this protease is expressed at much higher levels uh, compared to grade auricular nerve that basically doesn't express it at all or at minimal levels. And how does this influence clinical outcomes? We looked at whether concentrations of this protein in patients' plasma correlates with the severity of preoperative hearing loss, and the answer is yes, both when measured in terms of pure tone average and word recognition. And more uh, equally importantly uh, and interestingly, this uh, enzyme also correlates with the inability to completely remove the tumor. Because when we are resecting the vestibular schwannoma, sometimes we find it to be really stuck to the facial nerve. And because this is histologically a benign tumor, then we will leave a little bit of the tumor behind to protect the facial nerve and not uh, inflict permanent facial paralysis on the patient. But we always wonder, why was this tumor so sticky? Why couldn't we remove it completely? Well, MMP14 could be one of the reasons, because we find that tumors that express higher levels of MMP14 uh, were associated with greater likelihood of subtotal uh, tumor resection as opposed to gross total tumor resection. And importantly, this was more predictive than other traditionally used metrics such as tumor volume or tumor growth rate determined from serial radiographic imaging. So now building on this theme of the importance of the extracellular matrix in mediating tumor-associated hearing loss, we decided to look at fibrosis, tumor fibrosis. And this is a collaborative work with Lei Shu at Mass General Hospital. And we zoomed in on one molecule, losartan. You all know that losartan is an antihypertensive. So what are we doing here? Uh, well, it turns out that losartan is also known to reduce fibrosis. Losartan is already used in clinical trials and even in some applications for um, uh, other malignancies like uh, ovarian cancer and pancreatic cancer and has been shown to actually prolong life by many months, which is a big deal in these rapid killers. Um, and we were intrigued to uh, look at losartan because a prior study published 10 years ago in neurosurgical literature, looking at nearly 300 patients, reported that the severity of hearing loss was correlated with the degree of fibrosis in the tumors. They attributed that fibrosis to microhemorrhage. So the first thing that we do, did was use these human vestibular schwannoma samples resected from patients and looked at whether they express relevant receptors. And on the far right, you can see that they abundantly express angiotensin II receptor 1, uh, a related angiotensinogen, as well as other extracellular matrix proteins, such as collagen 1, shown on the far left, 
and hyaluronic acid binding protein. Now, uh, the next step was to move to a mouse model uh, because animal models still provide very important insight into the underlying mechanisms. And animal models also allow us to study uh, function, in particular to test hearing. So we developed a mouse model where we stereotactically implant tumor cells into the cerebellopontine angle, and then we let the tumor grow, and we measure hearing serially. So in one group of mice, we just did that, and in another group of mice, we treated them with losartan, starting seven days after tumor, implant, tumor cell implantation. And uh, it was really striking that mice that were treated with losartan did not have any hearing loss, uh, because you see that their responses here completely overlap with responses from uh, non-tumor bearing mice compared to, uh, to uh, mice that had tumors and were not treated with losartan who had hearing loss uh, when measured both in terms of uh, autoacoustic emission thresholds and uh, auditory Branson evoked response uh, thresholds when we focus on wave one amplitude and threshold. What's the underlying mechanism? How is this happening? Uh, we found that uh, losartan acts by several mechanisms in parallel, one of them being a reduction of neuronal edema and another one is by re reducing the inflammatory response. So we are back to inflammation. And uh, now, moving back to humans, we did the study, and Sasha Vasilich, who is here in the room with us, did these studies, where we collected a number of human tumor samples. We collected conditioned media from them and quantified interleukin-6 concentration in there and found that the concentration of interleukin-6 correlated with the severity of cochlear damage that these secretions produced when we apply them to organotypic cochlear cultures. Uh, well, this begs the question of, do people who take losartan for unrelated reasons have less hearing loss than those who don't take losartan and have vestibular schwannoma. So this was a retrospective uh, chart review, and we found that the answer is yes. Basically, people who took losartan had no progression of their hearing loss compared to people who took other uh, antihypertensive medications, not from this uh, angiotensin receptor blocker class, or who took no antihypertensives at all. You can see in uh, red here that the follow-up time for patients taking losartan and related ARPs, the follow-up time was less. It was about five years because these are more modern antihypertensives, so they haven't been around for as long as some of the other antihypertensives where we have up to 15 years of follow-up. Uh, so in summary, what I've shown you when it comes to vestibular schwannoma is that there are several molecules that most certainly play a role in uh, tumor-associated hearing loss and other outcomes. We have talked about TNF-alpha and a close cousin, interleukin-6, both of which are pro-inflammatory cytokines. But it turns out they're not independent. They're actually interdependent because TNF-alpha is known to regulate MMP14, which in turn is known to affect TNF-alpha expression. A couple of years ago, a group from the UK, from the University, University of Manchester, showed for the first time in human patients that the degree of inflammation, intratumoral inflammation, correlated with tumor growth in patients with vestibular schwannomas. And to th do that, they used a specific PET tracer that uh, was able to highlight inflammation. So further validated everything that I've shown you thus far, including bioinformatic analysis and targeted molecular approaches. But we know that inflammation is not the only player. In fact, we had previously shown that these tumors can secrete extracellular vesicles, and uh, extracellular vesicles secreted by tumors that cause hearing loss have the cargo that's capable of causing direct damage, unlike the extracellular vesicle secreted by tumors that do not cause hearing loss. The quest is ongoing in the lab trying to figure out what are the bad guys in these extracellular vesicles because they could serve as therapeutic targets. 
In the meantime, several others potential biomarkers have been identified by others uh, in uh, plasma uh, as well as in patient CSF and finally in histological tumor specimens. In terms of translational impact, of course the biomarkers that are circulating in plasma have the greatest value because you can monitor that longitudinally and prospectively without the need to remove the tissue and have histological diagnosis. So if these tumor secreted molecules play a role in hearing loss, that now begs the next question of well, what prevents them from circulating everywhere, anywhere they want? And can they cause hearing loss in the contralateral ear? And the answer is yes. This was a retrospective study that involved over 600 vestibular schwannoma patients, some of whom were followed for 20 years with serial audiometry. And we find that those who have abnormal baseline hearing in the tumor-affected ear were at increased risk of having hearing loss in the contralateral ear. So then taken together, today I've shown you two approaches uh, that will enable personalized diagnosis and therapy of human hearing loss. Uh, one was focused on using uh, human-induced pluripotent stem cells to develop uh, cellular models of hearing loss, and the other one focused on using tissue, and in this fact, tumor tissue, to identify molecular pathways that the, the key drivers of tumor growth and tumor-associated hearing loss. And this approach is certainly um, in alliance with the Stanford Medicine's focus on precision health, which aims to be predictive, proactive, preemptive, personalized, and patient-centered. So with that, I'd like to acknowledge people from my lab who have contributed to the work that I've described, many of whom have rejoined us at Stanford, uh, and uh, some of them are listening to the talk, either in person or via Zoom, and my many collaborators across many institutions in the world, and of course the funding agencies that have supported us. So with that, I am ready to take questions. Let's see, I, there may be some in the chat. Well, Tina, yes. Tina, I'll go ahead with the question. Yes. So how does, how does the tumor necrosis factor, which is a small polypeptide of some sort, protein, how does it get inside the ear? And if the schwannoma is secreting it, is it causing like local damage as well? Yes, that's a great question and the answer is indeed. Uh, the tumor arises from the balanced nerve, from the vestibular nerve, which is right adjacent to the cochlea. And uh, TNF-alpha could diffuse into the inner ear through the cochlear facet, for example. Or it could take a more uh, complicated route and get into bloodstream and then circulate that way. However, we think that the local diffusion is probably the predominant factor because we see most of the damage unilaterally. For hearing loss to occur in the contralateral ear, it really takes about 18 years. So that's a long time. What is fascinating about intracranial processes is that they suppress systemic immune response. So that, that is actually really interesting. Any kind of uh, in an intracranial tumor or head trauma, uh, stroke, they suppress systemic immune function. And we think these tumors may be doing something to that degree, but to a much lesser degree than malignant processes, because histologically this is a benign tumor. Uh, it's just in a really bad location, uh, so that when it grows, it can compress the brainstem and even lead to death from brainstem compression. Tina, th um, this fascinating work, just, just tremendous stuff. Um, I, I was particularly struck, you know, with, with the biomarkers regarding vestibular schwannomas, um, you know, and you're, do you find that some of these biomarkers are, um, affect um, hearing or um, word recognition scores more preferentially? Like, do you have some biomarkers that are affected more so or more likely to be observed with, with poor uh, speech recognition in particular, as opposed to decrements in hearing loss, or do these things tend to go hand in hand? Uh, great question, Matt, and uh, sometimes they go in hand in hand, but sometimes they don't. Uh, this, is a, this is ongoing work uh, where we have collected uh, 
blood samples from over 150 patients thus far. We're still analyzing what they're showing. We have only a cross-sectional time point because we collected blood uh, on the day of, but before tumor resection. But what we are finding thus far, and these are all unpublished data at this point, is that there are some uh, biomarkers that seem to be uh, more robust. And in terms of their correlation with the severity of hearing loss, they vary. Some cause both drops in word recognition and pure to tone average. Others cause drops in only one. Others are more associated with tumor growth rate or difficulty of tumor resection. So basically, it's a complex matrix. It's not one size fits all. And this really calls for this personalized approach because if we serially collect blood from patients, so this is a dream for these patients who have tumors, and not only vestibular schwannoma, I think this approach is applicable for all sorts of diseases that we study. And if we analyze that uh, serially, then we'll find out uh, what changes in what markers correlate with clinical outcomes. Uh, and then we can personalize it for a given individual. I, I think we are learning a lot about these personal differences already. Uh, when it comes to COVID infection, for example, well, some people don't have hearing loss at all as a result. And why is that? Or kids don't really get sick uh, compared to adults. Uh, and I, I recently circulated to some of you this paper, which was really fascinating and came out of uh, nature biotechnology. And they did single cell sequencing of uh, sinonasal tissue in kids versus adults and found really striking differences in innate immunity. So basically, kids' noses are primed to always be ready to respond. And for adults, we are not. And that's why we tend to get sicker, not only with COVID-19, but with other upper respiratory tract infections. So most surely, there will be differences among all of us. And the aim of this approach is to figure out how we are different and tailor therapies that are appropriate for us, but even better, prevent disease early on. Because wouldn't it be awesome if we could uh, collect blood from patients and tell them when there are only five cells that are causing the tumor? We don't have the sensitivity yet. However, in mice, we can detect tumors when there are only 100 cells of the tumor, which is really remarkable. The way we can do that is that we transduce these cells with Gaussian luciferase. It's a secreted protein. So the key here is secreted. We don't need tissue. It's secreted into blood, and we can see how tumor growth rate directly correlates uh, with the concentration of Gaussian luciferase in blood. And if we can develop similar, similarly sensitive techniques for other tumors and other diseases, the whole idea is to prevent disease. We want to stay as healthy as possible for as long as possible. Yes. Yes. Could you envision using that as a strategy uh, for delivery of genetic material into hair cells uh, that modify the virus? Great question. So the question that John asked is, given this striking expression of ACE2 on hair cells, could we use that to our advantage to deliver therapies directly to hair cells? And I think this is a tremendous opportunity. Uh, and it really opens up for future studies and future exploration because this is now human tissue. And numerous studies have shown that when it comes to viral vector transduction, what works in mice doesn't really work in humans when it comes to gene therapy. This is why non-human primate models are really critical when thinking about translation to humans. And lots of gene therapy companies are really almost exclusively working with non-human primates at this point, but even they are different because there are different kinds. And for example, sino monkeys are better models of most humans. Uh, but now if we have human tissue, we can get there much faster and really less expensive. Monkeys are ridiculously expensive. And we don't really want to be destroying any living species if we don't need to. We want to use animals when they're necessary, but we want to learn from human tissues as much as possible. And this is an enormous potential in a surgical department. We are removing tissues all the time. So I think it's a really tremendous opportunity for us to lead the way.
And you know, there's a lot of recommendations from cardiologists, don't stop your AV inhibitor, mm -hmm. you know, it's not hurting the children, it's not doing anything, there's debate about this. Um, do you envision trying AV inhibitors as well as a substitute of your heart test? Great question, Lisa. And indeed, there are some studies that have been completed as well. Initially, outcomes were mixed. These were all retrospective studies. The largest ones came out of China for obvious reasons. It's a huge population of patients, and they had the largest numbers of people infected with COVID initially. And right now, the evidence actually supports the use of a, uh, ARB inhibitors. So it's angiotensin receptor blocker inhibitors, but also ACE inhibitors in possibly alleviating the severity of the symptoms. Because if you block the receptor, yeah, the virus shouldn't get in. But, but there were also studies uh, saying that some people who were on it maybe had more infection. But now, like any topic that's worth discussing, there's always controversy. Uh, but uh, now there are more and more studies in favor of actually saying that it helps. So definitely the current recommendation is don't stop your antihypertensives. They're not hurting you and they may be helping. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, Alan. You know, there was a wonderful presentation. There's a whole large body of work there. I was very interested in the TNF-alpha aspect of it. So in, in some temporal bone studies, they also show that the vestibular system has hair cell loss in striatum of patients. Did you, do you think it's the same mechanism that causes degeneration of that system from the striatum of tissues? Yes, great question, Alan. Uh, so if you guys haven't heard the question, the question is, do these similar mechanisms that we have observed in the cochlear tissue apply to the vestibular tissue? And we think absolutely, if anything, it's easier for them to get to the vestibule because they typically, the tumors arise from the vestibular nerve that is directly hooked up to the vestibule. Uh, and this is something that we are now embarking on and we want to study more deeply. We really focused on hearing initially because of this conundrum. How are these tumors causing hearing loss? And it's not just tumor size. Uh, but that's definitely a tremendous opportunity, and I look forward to working with you and others to tackle that. Yeah, this is going to just show my ignorance, but when you resect a vestibular schwannoma, is there a spectrum of just inflammatory response around the tumor that you see, like the sticky ones? Do they have just more histologic evidence of inflammation? Or is it maybe this MMP or something else that's not a cellular recognized um, feature on histology, but... Great questions, Lisa. Most of these tumors have a lot of inflammation in them. Oftentimes, uh, half of the cells are tumor cells. We, uh, sorry, so half of the cells are inflammatory cells. The vast majority of them are macrophages. And in fact, when years ago, we looked at that question and found all these macrophage markers in these tumors, my neuropathology colleague was suspicious and thinking maybe the antibody is not working and uh, if they have so much inflammation in them they should be reclassified as uh, lymphomas not schwannomas but we know they are schwannomas uh -huh. and and since then clearly the role of inflammation in tumor biology in general both benign and malignant has been widely recognized you are correct that some tumors tend to be more pro-inflammatory and that was very nicely demonstrated when um, Christine Dean from the University of Miami actually and her team collected uh, tumor tissue from cysts within these tumors. So sometimes these tumors have little cysts, little or big cysts in them. And we know that these tumors are trickier. They can grow faster. It's not necessarily tumor growth, but it's just the cysts can expand and then the tumor bloats up and then it can cause more symptoms quickly. Uh, but they tend to be trickier to remove. And they, these cysts, tumor cysts, have lots of pro-inflammatory markers in them. There's another sort of stupid question, sorry, but uh, you talked about the, the damage to the cochlea and the hair cells from the, the schwannoma. Mm -hmm. Is it possible that the schwannoma arises because of inflammation that gets in through the ear, through the middle ear and then the inner ear? I mean, because I mean, isn't the brain more of a protected environment that the, just the genesis of the tumor, maybe it comes from the other direction? That's a really, really interesting question, Lisa. So wh what makes the tumor grow? Why does it arise there? Uh, it's probably a billion dollar question. <laughs> uh, there are small cells everywhere, right? Yeah. They wrap up 
all of our peripheral nerves, pretty much. Why this nerve? Yeah. And in fact, among the cranial nerves, yeah. this is the most common location, yeah. the vestibular nerve. And so there's clearly something special about Schwann cells that wrap around the vestibular nerve. Uh, in terms of the inner ear and bad things initiating in the inner ear, uh, I think it's much less likely. The inner ear is actually incredibly protected mm -hmm. against inflammation. Mm -hmm. um, there is uh, an immune system in the inner ear, and it's really uh, all set to prevent inflammation. Uh, we know that there can be the so-called sterile inflammation that occurs, for example, after noise trauma. After noise trauma, we can detect all these pro-inflammatory cytokines in paralymph. Um, but uh, even the bone around the inner ear, it's one of a kind. Uh, it's called the OD capsule, and it's different than other bones in the body because it doesn't remodel. And remodeling means uh, the balance between bone formation and bone breakdown, uh, and it requires uh, the interaction of osteoblasts and osteoclasts and entails release of pro-inflammatory cytokines. Well, that would be really bad if it happened in the ear because we know that these pro-inflammatory cytokines cause hearing loss. We know that a middle ear infection, if it spreads into the inner ear, will cause sensory neural hearing loss. We know that people with meningitis, where they have all these pro-inflammatory cytokines circulating in their CSF, they can develop sensory neural hearing loss. In fact, not only sensory neural hearing loss, their entire cochlea gets ossified. So that's why for the residents in the group, when we have patients with meningitis and sensory neural hearing loss, we want to operate on them as quickly as possible while we can still insert a cochlear implant in. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is a lot to be learned about the entire immune environment. But when it comes to the inner ear, it's actually really fascinating that there are no primary malignancies of the inner ear. That's a tremendous potential to figure out how to prevent it elsewhere. There are metastases, but they are typically not to the inner ear. They, are, they go to the petrous apex, and that has to do with the blood supply. Mm -hmm. So the inner ear is truly a fascinating organ. Uh, that's why I've been studying this for decades. But lots to be learned. And uh, it will impact not only hearing loss, but I think lots of branches of medicine. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very good. Uh, quick question. Yes. Very fantastic presentation. Uh, just utilizing the hook of the gene therapy. If you have a clear um, way to deliver intercochlear and you have now a target, the ACE receptors, what is, uh, like, why can't we move forward with this? Thinking about hearing loss for genetics cause, right, where you have very clear causes, the connexin 26 and so on. Why can't we move uh, parallel to liberal morosis where we use a viral vector to deliver um, uh, for retinal uh, amaurosis, why can't we move forward treating uh, genetics uh, cause for, for, for healing loss through gene therapy? What do you think it's Great hindering us? Uh, this is a really vibrant area, uh, gene therapy for hearing loss. There are at least three companies that I know out there uh, re recently started really exclusively focused on gene therapy for hearing loss. This is clearly a huge opportunity. Uh, because hearing loss is genetically incredibly heterogeneous. And in fact, half of hearing loss is attributable to genetic causes. Yeah. It's just that there are so many genes that can cause it. There are already more than 200 genes identified to cause hearing loss. Yeah. And we suspect that there are probably more than 350 based on studies in animals. Um, and so, yes, this is really interesting. Uh, there was a clinical trial in the United States focused on gene therapy for hearing loss. It was recently completed. That study was based on the delivery of 801 gene to supporting cells to make them transdifferentiate into hair cells. Mm. Um, it didn't really show efficacy across the board. But it doesn't really mean that gene therapy doesn't work. I think the limitation of the study uh, reflects our current inability to see what is wrong in a living human inner ear. Because today, the only way of knowing what's happening in a, in a human ear is to study autopsy specimens. When people die of unrelated causes, they donate their ears for study. From animal models, we know that if the organ of cord is gone, if it's the so-called flat epithelium, 
this gene therapy, of course, will not work because there are no supporting cells yeah. to receive the viral vector and make them transdifferentiate. So in a parallel effort that I didn't have time to talk about today because I cut my presentation in half, <laughs> yeah. uh, but I'm, I'm happy to uh, discuss that at some other point, we are developing a tiny imaging probe. Uh, we are aiming for 400 microns in diameter that would allow us to do flexible microendoscopy of the inner ear. Wow. And we now know that it's possible. Uh, a paper demonstrating the feasibility of this overall approach was recently published, but that's only the beginning. We know that the probe that we have now definitely needs improvement, and that's what we are aiming for. Awesome. Awesome. <laughs> Go, Tina. Yeah. Yeah. to see if there were any questions in the chat. Oh, was oh, the host would like you to unmute. <laughs> That's a problem. We, I don't want to unmute. Can you guys hear me on Zoom? Yeah, I think I think you have to Matthew, hello. <laughs> Matthew. So what was the first symptom? Hearing loss or tinnitus are both great question, uh, Jen. Often it can be either. Uh, for most patients it's hearing loss, but oftentimes it's both. They come in with both. Okay. I think that uh, I think there are no more questions. Thank you so much for your participation. Matthew.